Shopping has become a national pastime for our culture. Weekends are spent shopping for new clothes or for things to use around the house. But there's another type of shopping going around too, and that's church shopping. People are looking for a church that checks all of their boxes. But a church only has what we bring to it. We are the church, and God has given us a great responsibility as His first responders. That's coming up next as Arkansas Live starts right now. <clears throat> you know, yesterday I was beginning to read to you um, the four characteristics of a church. And I want to continue with that today where our text has been Matthew 16, where Jesus said, uh, I've come to build my church. And my endeavor is to get you to see that the church is God's first responder to everything. It's God's first responder to times of trouble. The first characteristic of the church, which is the body of Christ, is it's a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21 says, Behold, all things, pa old things pass away, all things become new. The church is a new creature, a new creation, something that never existed before. The New Testament church was born by the Spirit of God after Jesus had been crucified, dead, buried, raised from the dead. On the day of Pentecost, he said, wait until you're endued with power from on high. So the church was born in a blaze of glory of God's presence and God's power. Uh, when the church is the church and not just some resemblance of what man thinks it should be, the people of God, uh, led by the Spirit of God, doing the work of God, evil cannot stand against them. As Jesus told Peter, the gates of hell cannot prevail against you if you're the church. But so many of our churches have not been founded on the things that, <coughs> excuse me, that we know are the church. So the church is a new creation. The church is built and belongs to Jesus. The gates of hell will not prevail against that church. Let me read you something that I picked up. I, I got this out of my library. I've had this for many, many years. It was a gift to me by some church members <clears throat> probably 15, 20 years ago. And it's a book called The Authority of the Believer. John McMillan was a pastor for many years. And he has a chapter in here called The Panoply of God or The Covering of God. <clears throat> and dealing with the church as referred to in Ephesians chapter 5 when it says put on the whole armor of God he says the only place of safety is the occupation of the seat itself it says we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies far above the enemy if the church abides steadfastly by faith in this location, seated with him in the heavenlies. The enemy puts forth all his wiles to draw him down in spirit. But once out of his seat, his authority is gone. He no longer is dangerous and is open to attack. Keep in mind that all the attacks that we have seen and, and you've you got to know this as we talk about the church, God's first responder. All the attacks we've seen, wars, rumors of wars, hurricanes, tornadoes, disasters, terroristic attacks, shootings, bombings, virus, civil unrest, all of these things, everything that steals, kills, and destroys are about knocking the church out of its place of authority. I'm serious. This is not an oversimplification, not a generalization. Satan is after the church or else Jesus would have never said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. 
He would have said the gates of hell will not prevail against the government, civil authority, the president. <clears throat> he didn't. He said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The church is God's first responder. Therefore, everything is designed by Satan to destroy the church. Have you noticed in the last year or two, or maybe three now, that President Trump has restored more religious liberty to the church than any president ever has before? Why is he doing that? To maintain the church's autonomy and authority in the earth. You know, you've had presidents in the past that have opened doors to abortion, homosexuality, saying things like America is no longer a Christian nation. All these things were designed to take away from the church. All these things were a shot at Christianity. Granted, the church did not stand up when prayer was taken out of school in 62, 63, abortion on demand in 73, homosexuality, uh, transgenderism, all the things that were immoral, <clears throat> even an abomination to God. The church never stood up. The church never went to Washington, D.C. and flooded the halls of Congress. The church didn't do that. Oh, groups did, splinter groups, other little groups. Uh, the church, by and large, didn't uh, go up there and, and stand in the face of Congress and the Supreme Court and say, no, we're not going to have this. This is the government of the people, by the people, for the people. And the people are here, and we're saying no. Church didn't do that. And Satan has been shooting at the church little by little, trying to chip away at our authority. <clears throat> On one hand, he minimizes the church, gets it off into being like the world, visitor-friendly, seeker-friendly, relevant to the society. All that was a trap. That's been the single most damaging thing to the church ever. The dumbing down of the church began in the visitor-friendly, seeker-friendly movement, and it has watered down the church, uh, dumbed down the church to try and keep the church from being God's first responder, the authority. We don't want to get involved. We just want to hold up in our little group, us four and the more. Uh, we just want to do good deeds. You know, we want to rake yards, paint houses. We want to be uh, good to the community. But we don't want to be the church. We don't want to stand against the wiles of the devil. We don't want to pull down strongholds. Uh, we don't want to make the devil mad. We don't want to make politicians mad. Well, the Bible says just the opposite. The Bible says that we're supposed to stand up and be the church. And this author, John McMillan, he goes on to say, if the church will stay seated in the heavenlies, meaning hold on to your authority that Jesus gave you, listen to this. This is so, this is so powerful, but it goes over most Christians' head. Uh, he says, if we will stay seated and uh, keep our armor on, then we can successfully withstand in the evil day and having thrown all, overthrown all foes and remain unshaken. I preached on that just a few weeks ago. We have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken while everything else is being shaken. And please don't buy into this terminology that you are are bombarded with, even in the churches, even among Christian television, and, and but especially the world. Please don't buy into this uh, uncertain times. I'm so tired of hearing that. These are not uncertain times if you know what the Bible says. If you know God, if you know the Word of God, there's nothing uncertain about God or uncertain about His Word. <clears throat> or the next one is, this is the new norm. This is not the new normal. Do not accept this as the new normal. If you do, you bought the farm. This is normal. This is not uh, business as usual. This is certainly not new. Uh, it's, it's been around for uh, generations, decades. Don't, don't buy into these terms, the new normal uncertain times. We're all in this together. Most people don't even know what that means and never stop to 
to, to, to think about it. But John McMillan says, if you will stay seated with Christ in the heavenlies, what Jesus told you in Matthew 16, he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind, I'll bind. Whatever you loose, I'll loose. If you'll stay seated with your armor, fully clothed with the armor of God <clears throat> in your authority, listen to this. Remain unshaken. There is no suggestion of defeat. Secure within his armor, the believer may disregard the enemy. Did you hear that? The believer, the body of Christ, may disregard the enemy and give his entire attention to the exercise of the ministry to which he's been called. Satan's whole goal and MO is to destroy the church. All the attacks, everything, eventually is to destroy the church, to hurt the church. That's Satan's MO. That's his operation. That's why he exists. He hates God. He hates the church because the church is the body of Christ. Satan, the only reason Satan attacks the president, the governors, the mayors, the cities, the races, the only reason he attacks these entities is not because they're so all important or he hates them. It's because they represent God and he hates God. So he's trying to destroy everything that looks like God. But if we will not sit down, if we will stay seated with Christ in the heavenlies by that, <clears throat> if we will maintain our authority and our power that Jesus gave us, he said, the gates and authority and powers of hell will not prevail against us. When um, Sarah Huckabee was the press secretary to President Trump before she stepped down, uh, I just happened to be with her dad, Governor Mike Huckabee, here in the studio. He was doing some taping, and I came over just to say hello. And I asked her how Sarah was doing. This was early in her days of press secretary. He said, Pastor, Sarah told me that on any given day in the White House, they wake up to over a hundred issues every day. That might be more than that. But she said no less than a hundred issues every day. Now, let me ask you a question. How would you like to wake up every morning facing a hundred issues that you had to deal with? <clears throat> Most people can't handle that. Why is that so? Why is one party so dead set against killing and destroying the other party? It's the devil. It's Satan himself. He is the one that raises up the haters. And so here you have a virus. Right in the middle of the virus, you have a brutal rogue cop killing murder. It's always something. Satan is stirring the pot. It's a, a politic uh, move over here, a politic move over here. It's an immorality over here and something else over here economic, uh, political, religious. It just, it's a cauldron. Why is that? Satan. Satan hates God. He hates you. He hates the church. He's trying to destroy. <clears throat> Eventually, he's trying to destroy the church. That's his enemy. That's what he's after, folks. Get that through your head. You don't think that way when you watch the news uh, in the evening because their, their, their news is all edited and selective and, you know, they, they have an agenda. They have a reason for reporting what they do the way they do it. <clears throat> you can't go by that. You have to go by this. Did you know it, it says in Revelation there was a war in heaven? <laughs> the first war began in heaven. <clears throat> it was Satan trying to destroy God, trying to overthrow God on his throne. So just keep that in mind. Every time you see 
uh, political, religious, governmental, civil, rioting, uh, challenging. Uh, uh, you can even go as so far as the hurricanes, tornadoes. Anytime you see anything that steals, kills, or destroys, it's always uh, about the church. Eventually, <clears throat> he's trying to destroy the church. Uh, just remember that when you hear these things and you face these things and you can go right past the visible and see the invisible. You can see what Satan is really after. He's going about it uh, with a while or a scheme. Now, l l let me uh, proceed. Being the church, God's first responder. In Matthew 5, uh, verse 13 through 16. Let's go over there. Let's back up uh, a few chapters. We were in Matthew 16. Let's go over to Matthew 5 and let's go to verse 13. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Now this is what was known as the Sermon on the Mount. If the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and gives light unto all that are in the house. So let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven. It's talking about the church. It's talking about the church as salt and light. Let me, let me say this about salt <clears throat> and compare it to the church. Salt seasons and preserves. I've, I was told that if you keep salt in its purest chemical form, it'll never change. It'll never lose its saltiness. It'll never lose its savor or its preservation. My grandfather used to tell me that they would kill hogs after the first frost and they would use salt to cure the meat. Salt preserves and salt seasons. Have you, have you noticed since the virus that all the restaurants that are open now, there are no salt shakers and, and pepper shakers on the table? And you wonder why? Well, it's to prevent people from spreading germs from one customer to the other. You know, you, you never thought anything about it before, but every person that goes to a restaurant, they all handle the same salt shaker. <laughs> so they're trying to cut down on the transmission of any virus. But you can ask for salt, and they'll bring it out in a little cup, and you can use it as you, as you want, or you can take a pinch of it if it's just you and spread it on your food. Salt preserves and seasons. It purifies. If you have a cut or a wound, go stick in the ocean. Salt water will heal it. Salt, listen to this, talking about the church, salt is not a commodity. Salt is the character of the church. We're talking about the church, God's first responder. If the salt loses its savor, loses its character, if the church loses its purity, preserving ability, and its seasoning then the world sinks back into disorder and death. <laughs> there are people that hate the Christians. They hate Christianity. They hate Christians. But if it weren't for us, the world would stink, and it does, and it would not be preserved. We are the light and the salt because we're the church, not because of who we are, but because <coughs> of who Jesus is, and he said that we would be the salt and the light of the earth. So if after we leave and we're leaving, after the catching way of the church, the rapture of the church, we're out of here. We're gone. And then those poor people that are left are going to wish we were still here. I'm talking about the church now. I'm not talking about the religious organization. If the church stays to itself and only gets turned inwardly, it's like the salt staying in the shaker. You can't 
salt anything. You can't preserve anything if the salt doesn't get out of the shaker. So if we stay to ourselves, our four no more, our groups, our retreat centers, our isolated places, we become pillars of salt. <clears throat> There's nothing to preserve. Salt does not become like the food it preserves. Boy, that's so good. I don't know where I got these notes, but they're good. Salt does not become like the food it preserves. Salt seasons and savors the food that you put it on. So if you're going to compare salt in the church, which Jesus did, you're the salt of the world, the light of the world, we're not to stay in the shaker. This is why I challenge pastors and church members, please don't stay at home. The church is open. The church is open. Go to church. Don't get comfortable sitting at home watching TV or online. Don't get, home, get uh, comfortable watching um, uh, live streaming, Facebook, YouTube. Pastors, don't get comfortable. Rally your church volunteer staff. Get them back in church. Most churches now are operating about 30%. The larger the church is, the more social distance that they can have. But we went to two services on Sunday, Sunday morning at 9, Sunday morning at 1030, split the, the congregation 50-50 so we could have more space and everything. But we still want the same people uh, to come to church. Don't get comfortable. Don't get lax. Now's not the time to get lax. Now's not the time to, to take a vacation and, and go off. Now's the time to ramp it back up. Get back in church. Hebrews says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, as you see the day approaching. So it's, it's not time to, to put the salt back in the shaker. It's time to take the cap off and start sprinkling the salt everywhere. Become the church. You are the church. Become the light. After we're gone, there'll be no light. I remember, that, and this, this touched me so it grieved me, I, I really, I got saved at the Grand Ole Opry, the mother church of country music. And I really like country music, still do. I don't like the words, but I like the music. And cause most country music was born out of par poverty, sorrow, downtrodden, broken heart. I mean, you, you can just feel it in the, in the music and the words especially. But the one song and singer that I so enjoyed was Hank Williams. And Hank, bless his heart, was a miserable individual. Died at 29 years of age, choked on his own vomit, the backseat of his Cadillac. He, he was an alcoholic. His life was a mess. But Hank was raised in church. And some of his earlier songs, I found one on the Internet the other day because I was looking for references to Armageddon. And all of a sudden, I found this song, Armageddon, by Hank Williams. And I thought, I never heard that. So I pulled it up. And he, he mispronounces the word. Roy Acuff told him, he said, Hank, if you're going to sing these songs, you need to learn to pronounce the words. Well, Hank was born in Alabama, southern boy. And he pronounced Armageddon, Amugatan. And it's called The Battle of Amugatan by Hank Williams. And you can hear his life story. And if you saw the, uh, the, the film produced by Ken Burns, The Story of Country Music, you'll see Hank's comments at the end of that film. He was known for his song, I Saw the Light. He, he was a born-again Christian. He loved God. He sings that song about Armageddon right out of the Scriptures. He sang a lot of Christian songs. Some of them became famous. A lot of heartache songs, but I saw the light. And so they asked him as he was dying. They said, Hank, what about that song? I saw the light. And this just really hurt me for him. He said, son, there ain't no more light. He said, that light went out. I don't see that light anymore. I used to see it but I don't see it anymore. And he died. I believe he's in heaven 
because he professed Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and was born again. But isn't it sad that at the end of his life, known for the big song that he had written, I Saw the Light, he says, out of his desperation, there ain't no more light. He lost it. What I mean is he didn't see the light. He used to sing those happy songs. Then he started singing the sorrowful songs because of alcohol, his marriage, his life. We have to always see the light. I want to pray with you right now. Maybe right now you're sad, depressed, afraid. You don't know what's going on in the world. I want you to pray with me. You can still see the light. You're the salt. You're the light of the world. Would you pray with me right now? Just stop what you're doing. Close your eyes so you won't be distracted. And just say out loud so you can hear yourself, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe God raised you from the dead. Come into my heart, Jesus. Take away my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, Jesus came in. And I have a little booklet I'd like to send you. It's called God Loves You. It's on the screen right now. Dial that 1-800 number, 1-800-264-2525. Say, I prayed with Pastor Caldwell. I like that book. God loves you. Or you can go to our website, vtntv.com, and you can download the book for free. That's right. It's free. You can download it for free. It'll be yours. Uh, There's no strings attached, no letter to follow. It doesn't cost you anything. And we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow as we continue the church, God's first responder. Remember, Jesus is Lord over Arkansas. And wherever you're watching, to Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221, or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection, and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.